hear a song from Storm Large earlier in the show, but as we mentioned, she is now an author. She has been called an irresistibly rambunctious force of nature by geek love author Catherine Dunn. And back now to talk about her book, please welcome Storm Large back to the stage. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Storm. Well, thank you, Courtney. You, you've been a busy lady since you've been gone. I know. I've noticed. <laughs> it's great to have you back. Oh, it's so, so good to be back, yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I, I talked in your intro about your career trajectory. Um, it's kind of a nutty one. When you were playing in punk bands in San Francisco, did you ever imagine that you would be in front of a symphony orchestra at one point? Never, never, no. <laughs> Very, very strange, yeah. What did it feel like the first time that you had the orchestra behind you? I felt like a grown-up. <laughs> I really did. It was the most grown-up musical experience I've ever had. It was here. At the, the, it was Oregon Symphony. And, um, and Were you playing with Pink Martini on, no, in that show? No, it was my own band. It was me and James, and we were playing some songs from Crazy Enough. And um, it was... I think Thomas Lauderdale actually had quite a bit to do with lobbying the symphony to allow me there. Where I'm, <laughs> I have a bit of a reputation as a naughty pants. <laughs> so they took quite a bit of convincing. But it was, it was when we, w the way they rehearse, it's not a very rock and roll thing, but you get there, you get there about nine o'clock in the morning ready to sing and, and rehearse and sound check with the symphony. But that was kind of difficult at first, but the second we launched into a song, I just it, was, it took my breath away. It's, it, there's really nothing like it in the world. I mean, it, it had to have felt really powerful. Oh my God, it was, and we have such a great orchestra. We really have a fantastic, yeah, fantastic Portland orchestra Symphony. here in Portland. Yeah. So it's, it was such a pleasure that my first, my first experience was with one of the best in the country. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to talk about the book and in fact, um, and have you read a little bit from it because the book is mostly about your relationship with your mother and she had some unfortunate mental issues and, and a lot of the book is about that. And um, there's, a, there's a piece in the book that uh, is about maybe the worst psychiatrist in the world. We don't know necessarily by process of elimination, there must be one. Um, but I thought that maybe you could read that passage quickly so people have an idea. All right. I Marked. Came prepared. Totally ready. Um, Mom called everyone lovey. <clears throat> if she knew you for five minutes, you were lovey. Her psychiatrists were no exception. They were all familiar characters as Mom got locked up more and more frequently, and I was used to being around them. It was nothing for me to chat with this or that Dr. Lovey and practice being the tough little girl who was totally unfazed by the madness or sadness she had just seen. Oh well, I shrugged, my sneakered heel bouncing on the floor. Your mom's been having a hard week, but she'll be okay, Stormy, he said. Yeah, I know, it's no big deal. He was still writing with his head down, and I hated the quiet. At least I'm not gonna be crazy like her, right? Now, you know when you ask a question you already know the answer to, and you're just trying to make conversation? You're just being friendly, engaging, filling up any uncomfortable, quiet gaps. Kind of like, God, don't you just love chocolate? Or, what the heck is the deal about cats and Christmas tinsel anyway? You know it only ends up in their poop, right? <laughs> Stupid cats. <laughs> I expected that he would guffaw and say, oh, silly girl, of course not. And then he would ruffle the hair on my silly head as he passed by me on his way to do some doctoring elsewhere. But barely giving me a glance, Dr. Lovey nodded and he said, oh, well, yes, it's hereditary. You absolutely will end up like your mother. <laughs> and my heel stopped bouncing. As he tore off the piece of paper he'd been scribbling on and got up to leave, he said, I imagine to comfort me, probably not until your 20s or when you have children, whichever comes first. All I remember after that was getting very hot in my face and standing very still in the doorway. I bit my cheeks and heard the kerplip kerplop of ping pong going on around the corner. 
I wanted to walk away, take back the question, go back in time, ask him about something else, change the subject, or just shut up. But instead, I was frozen. Dr. Lovey, on his way out, said something about how lucky I was that we knew so much about my mother's illness now so that when the time came for me to get treatment, not to worry, we'll know how to take care of it. And then he left, just like your mother. Great, doctor. Thanks, Storm. So a lot of what this book is about is you doing everything you can not to turn into your mother. So right. what were some of the things that you did to not turn into her? Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, uh, I was nine or 10 when that happened. And, um, and to be fair, I know that sounds, it sounds ludicrous what the doctor said. It sounds horrible and terrible and irresponsible. Maybe it was those things, but that's still kind of the prevailing thinking of today. Addictions and mental illnesses run through family lines. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I started by just hating her first. And that started to creep in, just hating her and trying to just get her away from me and not think about her and running away from home and, and being a bit irresponsible with my body. <laughs> Let's just That's say. a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah, for the radio. <laughs> I'm cleaning up my act. I sing with symphonies. <laughs> it was very smooth. It was very smooth. So, I mean, a lot of people talk about how raw this book is, how open you are, how honest you are, and, and there's a lot of devastating scenes in, in the book, you know, uh, where you're doing heroin, you're getting off heroin. Uh, what was the process like for you to write all of these experiences out? You know, the, the, big, the big exclamation points that happened throughout my story of my life and looking back, those were kind of easy to look at. Um, it was nuancing them to make them funny and also also writing in general because I felt that to be an author you had to be incredibly educated and um, on a different trajectory as you said not a not a an old rocker who was trying to you know make her way through the world as a musician you know I I, I didn't think I had it in me to be an author so writing this thing having it being under contract to write a book is a bit in intimidating and daunting, especially when the whole time you're thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be the worst book ever. Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. People are gonna totally know I'm the worst writer ever. <laughs> but, um, so that was kind of the biggest, that was the biggest challenge. And also realizing um, that a lot of the terrible things that happened in the story were my own fault. <laughs> right, you, you were the creator of your own catastrophe, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah, I was a great architect of terrible decisions. Well, did it, how did that affect you as you were writing it? Were you beating yourself up for that stuff or were you able to? The process, what I did really uh, was just write and 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 just get everything, everything, everything out. Um, and the discoveries that I made in terms of like the small, small moments where I realized how cruel I had been to my mother and, and, and how I had taken steps to do really stupid things in the name of being tough, in the name of being cool, in the name of not being like her, were really selfish and yeah. really awful. Those things made me really, really realize why so many authors are terrible alcoholics. <laughs> 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 really bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but you know, process. it's it, you, you, you get to the other side of it and you know, and then you don't drink quite as much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 2010, there was a Swedish study that revealed similarities in the thought pathways of highly creative people and schizophrenics. And the, it, the study actually talked about how both groups lacked receptors that filter thoughts. And I wonder <laughs> um, if, if you do think that you have a little bit of what your mother had, whether you think that might feed you creatively a little Definitely. bit. Definitely. I think that if my mom, this is something else that came from, from going back and looking at her personality and how alike we really are, but how she was so stifled by her generation and by what she grew up thinking what she should be. 
Um, I'm not gonna go off on tenets of feminism or anything like right. that, but she thought she was gonna be a wife and a mom and just this great woman. And that was her being a great woman. Um, but I know that if she was born, I mean, I don't know, but a fantasy of mine is if she had been born in some circus family or a, a family of artists, or she was born in New York a little bit later, maybe, uh, she would have been a fantastic dancer or, or, a, or a choreographer or a painter or, uh, or just an eccentric, you know. She was really lovely and, and, and incredibly smart but so sad because she was very stifled and bottled up just by circumstance. Yeah, and you're, you're a performer. How was it for you to just write all these words down, send them out into the world and people just took from them what they <laughs> wanted to. They interpreted them, them themselves. You That was actually, that was a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. Um, performing is, is so gratifying because, you know, you put on a nice outfit, you do your makeup, you do your hair, and you make sure your voice and your body are together, and then you throw yourself out at people, rah, and you sing, and you try to be sexy, and you try to be engaging, and people are like, yay! Wow, I love you. And then at the end of the night, you get money and drinks. <laughs> and it's awesome. And then you go home and you're like, my life rules. <laughs> but then when you're alone, when you're writing a book or a story or an essay or a show, you know, you're alone in your house and you could write something that's really funny. You'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're alone and nobody cares. <laughs> It's really challenging, and you know that as well as anybody. Yeah, yeah, oh, I Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I think I am hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, before you go, um, I did want to ask you, do you, uh, I, do you think that you are the only memoirist in history to have your photo on the cover of your book flipping your audience off? It's not flipping my audience off. It's just cheeky. I don't know. I don't think so. Didn't Tommy Lee have something terrible on his? Oh, did he? I don't know. He should. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> and it wasn't my idea. It was Simon and Schuster. So. Well, it's and it's a wonderful picture. Um, and you're actually going to sing one more song for us. I am. I, I believe. Think so. Am I going to do it right now? I, I think that you're going to do it right now. If you're wow. fine with that, I'll do it right now. Just well, for you. the book is lovely. Uh, the book is crazy enough. The author is Storm Large. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, and Courtney. Let's hear a song. <laughs> so good to see you.